Okay. okay. Good morning. Yeah. Like Thomas said, my name is Gregor Weber, or if you can do an authentic German, you can say Gregor Weber. Good after. Uh, yes. Uh, I think it really nice, uh, ties in nicely, nicely to what Pauline said because she talked about liberation, and I will talk about constraints, about the opposite of liberation, basically. And um, what's a bit funny about the title is one of the reviewers sent me a paper by. Um, called the Cornell Program Synthesizer, which also started with a line, and this was from the 80s, I think, and it started with programming is not just, uh, programs are not just text. So that was pretty funny because I didn't read that paper at the time, but apparently someone in the 80s had the same idea, which might be a good thing, or maybe it didn't work out and we're both stupid, so let's <laughs> see. Okay, so first we need to talk about what our tools actually are, and for that, Oh no. I, uh, I looked at a uh, data set from uh, Stack Overflow. They, did a, they do an annual survey of programmers and they ask what kind of tools people use. Now the number of people might notice that the, um, when you add it up there are more than 100% here. That's because uh, most programmers use more than one tool. And uh, so that I can get to know my uh, audience and adjust my prejudice, I'd like to know what kind of tools are you using? Uh, who's in the camp of, of the IDE? Like IntelliJ, Visual Studio, Eclipse, NetBeans, what else is on here? Xcode is an IDE, I guess. Okay, and uh, more on the side of um, graphical text editors like Sublime, Atom, VS Code. Okay. And I think the only other category is something like magic, like Vim or Emacs. <laughs> okay, those are the wizards here. And I think the, the core editing experience of all these environments, as different as they may be, is really the same. I mean, of course, IDEs have this, these mighty structural features where you can do all, the, all kinds of structural editing and navigation. And the terminal editors have these crazy shortcut combinations where you can do all kinds of magic and I don't know, the graphical code editors are very fast or have a rich uh, plugin ecosystem, but when it comes down to the writing of the code, you're basically constructing text. And why is that a problem? Let's look at a simple example in the most difficult language in C. That's how it world. And looks fine, right? What's, what's the problem here? Well, uh, I, I used to work in an agency and uh, when we got user interfaces from clients who wanted to have their systems changed, uh, we used to print them out, I know, and uh, take a yellow and a red marker and just highlight whatever is wrong in the user interface. And what we, we tried to classify it into two categories. The red was for what can we what is not really necessary and uh, the yellow is for um, what's, what's maybe necessary for the functioning of the program but is still a bit tedious. And so I did that for that little C snippet. Now the red part, of course it has a function because it's, 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 it's for the documentary structure of the, of the code. It's for, for the, it's the indentation. It shows you how, it, how the program is scoped or how it, what the complexity looks like, how it's structured. And the yellow part has an even more important function because it, because it describes the syntax and it's what's necessary to make the program even run. And I even left out, I, I, I could have put uh, a red highlight at the end of every line because there's another <coughs> thing the user has to manage, which is line breaks. So there's at least 20-30% of the program which is about managing either syntax or, or code style, which we have to do every day while editing code. Which is from a user experience standpoint not really necessary. And of course that's that's a simple program, so if, if we look at, at more comp, uh, complicated examples, you will see more and more colors. Okay, what are, what are the specific problems with it? I think there are uh, a range of different perspectives we can take to, to look at it. The first one is the beginner's perspective, when you start learning to program. Most people are used to interacting with, well nowadays I think most, most, uh, mostly search engines, social networks, and those are kinds of programs that either accept, um, uh, 
accept free text and you can enter whatever comes to mind into Google and it will give you an answer or, or it constrains what you can input by having buttons or text fields in certain places. But code editors are something else. They're, they suggest that you can just enter anything because it's, it looks like a writing tool. It looks like you can just uh, put whatever you thought you have in mind uh, into the editor. But actually, they are very constrained in what you can enter. They, they have hard sy syntactic rules. And I think it's a bit difficult for, for beginners to also, because they don't only have to learn these syntactical rules, but they have to get into, into the programmer's mindset, into having a mental model of a state machine, and into thinking about logical uh, relationships between entities. And so I think there's a, there's, for, for beginners, there's a conflation of a whole, whole lot of different uh, subjects that's not really necessary. And um, I think what's also a bit uh, problematic is that we only, unless you're using an IDE, you only have one channel where errors are outputted, which is basically the compiler, which tells you either if your syntax is wrong or if your logic is wrong, which is, are two separate kinds of problems. And it kind of dil dilutes the, the, the channel because, uh, because you, you're, you, you get used to it drawing these uh, uninteresting syntax errors while, while you're more interested into the logical errors. Now let's look at it from the professional perspective. Um, I think if you program for a few years, the syntax of whatever language you're using becomes mostly ingrained and it becomes automatic. You tend to manage it without thinking too much about it, but still I think there's some cognitive cost to this. And still, and also you do have cases where you just have a typo or you slip and then there are too many braces and especially you don't have to use a lisp, lisp to have like five, six spaces in uh, parentheses in, in one place and your, our, our human brain is not good at subconsciously counting these braces. You have to really, if there's a lot of it, you have to really look into it and of course there are tools that can help you with it but ultimately you still have to do that yourself to express the right intent. The program, the compiler can't can't infer what you what you meant to write. So, so previously we, we in, in the previous talk we also looked into maybe solving it on a, on a language level, <laughs> at, um, so that it might might not even be necessary to to have syntax errors so we can express any idea we have and the compiler just <coughs> picks it up. I don't know what such a language looks, would, would look like. I mean, I think the uh, whole languages around the web platform, HTML, JavaScript, they were kind of written with a bit of that in mind at least, given that HTML, basically any HTML you can write is run by browsers and they try to interpret it and just show anything. And JavaScript is kind of similar in that regard. And, and, and at least in the JavaScript community, those parts that are not as clear are considered the bad parts now. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, if the idea has failed or just that specific implementation of it. And the last perspective I want to look at in that context is the code style, because um, I do many code reviews at my company, and it's one of the most glaring issues, and of course it's, it's superficial in a way, but then again, we mostly write code so it, so it can be read by humans, and it's it's just something that makes it, and an inconsistent style just makes it harder to read. And we have all these issues of annotations or tabs with the spaces and other issues. And it's, it's becoming such a, such a big thing now. I don't know if you, if you guys know the uh, show Silicon Valley from HBO. Uh, it's about, well, our uh, industry, more specifically the Silicon Valley brand of our industry. And there's even a scene in there where they have a discussion about tabs versus spaces, and it's a pop cultural show, and it depicts our industry, and it, they're talking about that, which of course made me laugh, but then again I felt very ashamed, which made me laugh. <laughs> of course, shameful laughter is great laughter, but then again, we sh I mean, I think it's a huge failing of us. Of course, we're all academic, and we, we're, we're grown up, we don't talk, we don't have these serious discussions about tabs versus spaces. But still, we are, I think we're enablers, we are, because we are, we are using tools. <laughs> Was this for spaces or <laughs> <laughs> Because, because we, are, we are using tools that, that allow that unnecessary freedom and that allow us to, 
to have these differences of opinion which are not necessary at all. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, different code slides are different across, uh, very much different across languages, like Python JavaScript has, um, Python has PEP8, I think it's called, the, the code style. In JavaScript has a lot of uh, competing code styles. I think Google is having a, has its own code style, code style for many different languages. Um, so there are some generally accepted rules, but that doesn't mean at all that everybody follows them. And of course, it's tedious to follow them because if you switch projects, you have to know what code style the uh, the project is written in, and you have to adjust. And it's just there's some cognitive load to it. So the question that came to mind when I was thinking about it, is code UI or is it business logic? Which one is it? Because we're, we're very interested in, in the separation of concerns, but what, what is code exactly? Is it, you are, it's kind of both, and that's, that's not a good thing. That's something we try to minimize. The, uh, I think a good example of this is the dangling comma. I don't know, have you heard of the dangling comma? It's, it's uh, when you have a collection of things. Uh, in, in a lot of languages, you can uh, add a comma to the last element. And that way, when, you have, when you're using a version control system, and you're adding or removing lines, you can see in the commit of the, of the, of the version of the system uh, that only one line changed versus if you don't have the dangling comma and you delete an element, you have to also have to delete the previous comma and so you change two lines and, and that's, that's a conflation of, of view and of logic and that's, and that's creating these cases where we have to decide, okay, either we write code that uh, works well with our version and versioning control, or it works well for the reader of the code, because dangling commas are, of course, not something we use in any other place. Another example is uh, React, which is... <coughs> sorry, a little bit of a sore throat. Yeah, React is a front-end framework written by Facebook, and it, I think it's a great framework. And but it, what it does is it adds um, a new way of writing HTML in JavaScript, which is it's basically just syntactical sugar for functions. It and uh, I mean I, I think it really helps to to identify parts of the code that are related to the view. But then again, it introduces it it, it changes the language itself just because you want to view the source code in a different way. Which again, I think, is because we're breaking separation of concerns. So there's uh, this thing called visual programming languages, and Feline uh, uh, already mentioned Scratch, uh, which is a great example of it. But uh, I want to talk about these kinds of visual programming languages, these what I would call tree languages, because they mimic the, the source code tree. And there are different. Uh, there are other kinds of visual programming languages as well, like um, LabVIEW you might have heard of, which is a programming language for um, all kinds of sciences. It's used in chemistry, physics, or um, the, if you're into game development, there's a blueprint for the Unreal Engine, which is also this kind of flow diagram programming language. But I want to look at tree languages specifically, because I think it's close to what the kind of, the kind of code we read. Uh, and that's actually a screenshot from scratch. So you can see it basically looks like code, but it's more uh, but you, you're using blocks that you can um, attach to each other and nest by using your mouse. And what's great, what's really great about it is there are no, it's not possible to create syntax errors in these, and there's no room for code style at all. But then again, it's, it's, it's for educational use, it's, it has a strong focus on mouse interaction. I don't really think you could be very productive in it. And what's another weird thing about it, and uh, another similar project by Google called Blockly, they are actually their own separate programming languages. So you can't build on the, on the already existing productive ecosystems of existing languages. So all of these visual programming languages, even though they should be just a view of our existing <coughs> code, are their own. I mean, of course I can understand it. it's probably simpler to just write what you need instead of like looking at all the craft of um, mystical features the existing languages already have and instead just build a simple language, but still, I mean, it's not the right tool for the everyday programmer's job. So, I want to think about building a better uh, alternative, and I think what's 
the most important feature that it should have is uh, that the common transformations we make, make to code are at least as fast as, it, as they are in the existing development environments. And text editors that, are, that allow you to enter text freely, they make it as fast as you are able to write and copy and paste or use your crazy shortcuts. And I, I, think, I think it's possible to, to actually beat that. And, um, but what we one ha would have to do is to really look at into all these different cases. What what do we actually? What kind of code transformations do we actually do? We we reorder arguments. We change types, and it's. I think it's it, it's necessary to to look at these common common tasks and see how how one could cut time. And um, I I don't want to rebuild the uh, those advanced features that IDEs offers like refactoring or other structural features because it's that's heavy work and it might even be possible if one builds a new editor engine to just plug it in into an, an existing env uh, development environment and uh, leverage the existing the, those features. And of course another important aspect is to always maintain syntactically correct code because I don't want to manage the syntax of my of my program and I also don't want to manage the code so it just should just uh, do that by itself. And, uh, and another thing that comes with it, uh, you remember the red, the red uh, indenting space in, in the C program. That's of course, uh, that's of course space you can navigate through with your cursor keys or whatever you're using. And I don't want that either. I just want to focus on my statements, on my expressions, on what my code uh, actually on the important part of my code. And things like dangling commas or JSX, what React is using, that's something we can construct as a view over the code. We don't have to exactly match what the underlying code looks like. And when, when, I, uh, when I showed this talk uh, to, uh, to a friend of mine, he, uh, that was his response, and I think <laughs> it was really fitting. Do we want programs in 2050 to still have to deal with missing semicolons? I, I don't think that Python, of course Python I don't, don't have some going, so it's a solved problem, right? No, of course it still has braces, it still has code, has code style. So there's lots of these kinds of issues. Uh, it's just an example that we still haven't solved yet, and they were still managing and it's tedious. So I hope I, I was I was hoping that I that I would have finished a whole um, language. Uh, editor by now, but unfortunately, um, my open source work doesn't pay for Netflix, so uh, it's <laughs> for now it's only a JSON editor. Oh, I don't have internet, but I have a local copy running. And you can uh, look at it yourself. The URL is was right here, but well, I will also upload the, the slides so you can look at it later if you want. And uh, yeah, the, the idea is you can, you can navigate, it's, for now it's only a JSON editor, so you can navigate through, uh, through a JSON uh, file and uh, on the right you can see all the shortcuts that are possible right now and so if, you, if I press the letter S, for example, I get a new object property and it's test. And, and so you, you can never construct an invalid JSON uh, file with it, but of course right now it's only JSON. And um, uh, but I but I think if you if you use it, it, that, it probably doesn't make much sense for me to use it in front of you right now because it's about the editing experience and you won't get to uh, get to feel that through me. Uh, so uh, I think it shows the potential of wh what such an editor could look like if we used it for. A programming language and not just JSON. JSON luckily is a subset of JavaScript, so I'm already halfway there. <laughs> so my next surely halfway. <laughs> Maybe not quite. But <laughs> so so my next steps for the for the next few months is uh, that I want to extend this and actually build it out to be a full JavaScript editor and then hopefully at some point an editor for every language there is. Yes. And that's it for now. Thank you. Alright, so we'll have a critical review or commentary from Fadim and I will I'll move so that we have a space here. That's not it's just I think this is the okay, uh, this 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 the hot seats. Yeah the hot seats. <laughs> Alright. Okay, I don't have slides, I just have notes that I will read.
I'm super happy we're talking about this because as you got from my talk, I use Scratch a lot, so I have some feelings about this. But what I really want to talk about is not your solution, not because it isn't there yet. I didn't know that. I could have guessed it probably. But I really want to talk about some of the assumptions you're making that led to the that may ever lead to the solution. Because I think you're glassing over some stuff that I might have some insights into, but also the room. So one of the assumptions you have is that text is bad, or that there could be something that's better than text. And you glance over that a little bit in the paper. So you say syntax errors are annoying, especially for novices, and they could, yeah. But what you don't really say is that they could break your flow. And there's quite some research actually into the flow of programming. So there are IDE plugins that measure, for example, when people go to email and then they come back and then it takes them an average of 15 minutes to get back to work. There's a famous paper slash blog post that's called Programmer Interrupted by Chris Barnum that really nicely explains from IDE interactions what happens? So I think there's an opportunity there to get more meat on the bones of why text is shit, because I'm with you there. But we can measure easily with a simple browser plugin if a syntax error happens, how long does it take until it's fixed? What type of syntax errors take the longest to fix? And I think these type of empirical studies could help deepen our understanding of what is wrong with text. By the way, if anyone has additions to stuff that might be relevant here, hit me so in the review I can add more background. Then also, what you're saying, in addition to text is shit, you also say current block based systems are shit in a sense. Because you say something like scratch also isn't good enough. We need a new thing. So there is also the assumption that current block Languages don't do it, like Scratch. Scratch might be for kids, but for people that are in the audience that don't know, in addition to Scratch, there's also Snap, which is a more grown-up version of Scratch that's also used in university teaching. And there's a similar system called App Inventor that is actually used by people to make apps. So that is already closer to a real production language entirely based on the paradigm of blocks. So maybe there is something to it. What you say in the paper a little bit is that one of the things that makes it really shitty is that you need to, to move the mouse. That Scratch and the other languages, they don't really have keyboard support, which is true. And this makes it really annoying and also very inaccessible. I did some work with programming for blind people and it's, it's of course, if something only relies on mouse keys, it's horrible. But I would just like, would like to like, note that Scratch is open source. So if you want to spend time on building stuff, you could also build keyboards. It's not impossible to build keyboards for, because the black-based black languages are such that you know what fits in a certain space. So it wouldn't even be that hard to make keyboard integration. But there are other things that you don't know. Probably maybe you haven't used that in a while, because many other things are shit about blocks as well. Uh, selecting stuff. If you have a stack of blocks, and I want to copy the two or three in the middle, I have to take the whole stack, take out the other two I want, put the stack back, and then copy the two. I can't easily with the mouse select a group of blocks to copy paste. And this is really very confusing because sometimes you want to have a top of a stack and you, you, you're dragging everything. So that selection and copying mechanism might be harder to fix than just the mouse and keyboard. So there are other things that could be really um, bad. Something else that's known to be bad about block based languages, also there's lots of research about that, is that kids, especially, uh, already from a young age, perceive blocks as not real programming. If you give kids Python and you give them blocks, they say, and eh, the blocks aren't real programming. <laughs> Probably we're doing that to them. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't imagine that that isn't real programming. But this, this is something that, you know, that might make blocks bad because. After a while, kids will say, yeah, yeah, I know this, I want the real programming. So the fact that something doesn't feel real is, could be a downside. But then what you also didn't talk about is what makes blocks really 
good. You could go a bit deeper in what's there because that if you do decide not to go my preferred route of fixing scratch, but make your own stuff, I get that. But then you really want to understand what is good about blocks. So one thing that's super good about blocks is that if you ask people, they don't perceive it as real programming. That is a benefit as well. I know people like school teachers that have made little programs in Scratch for their own usage to calculate something or to express something in a classroom. The school teachers, they would never make something in Python or something that looks real. The fact that it doesn't look real is also very powerful. And also, what and one of the reasons I am like super in love with Scratch is discoverability. If you if you log into Scratch, you see all the blocks that are there. You don't really need like API documentation. All the blocks are there, and if you want to know what a block does, you just double click it and it executes right in front of your eyes. So that discoverability of blocks, I think, is super super strong from block-based languages. That I would like a block-based editor on top of Java or C, whatever. Because not only do I not have to memorize all the blocks, also do I, if I click a category of string operations, I see everything. And if I've forgotten what it does, I click it and it happens. So discoverability is really interesting. And of course you don't have to just like look at something and think what is good and bad. There are a number of frameworks you can use to assess the quality of Language. So I myself wrote a paper on the success factor of domain specific languages that has a survey with a number of success factors like discoverability and learnability. But of course if you want to go a bit deeper than that, there's also the cognitive dimensions by Alan Blackwell that have a clear list of th these are the type of things you want to look at if you're evaluating the language or user interface. So. Basically, I'm giving you like lots of homework. The arguments are really good, but you might want to look at a lot of stuff that's already been done in this space. And really, before you build something new, really understand what's bad about text, what's bad about current blocks, and what's really good about blocks, because then you can build something soon. Thanks. And I think that the great, the great bit about this format is that not only you get to do the homework, but we'll send it to everyone. <laughs> yeah, so seriously, because we, we will publish these reviews in text as well. So for my talk, but also for my review, and I think for all of the reviews, yeah. if you all have input to my review that will be useful to people reading his paper and my review, hit me up with links because we want to make this format as strong as possible. Not just for people that read it, but also for the viability of this thing we're doing today. We really want to have strong papers and strong reviews to show the scientific community that yes, open reviews, publishing them is a thing that we want. So if that's a view you see for academia, help us make these reviews be as good as possible because then maybe we get to do this again.